So good evening. Uh, happy to be back here in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, my name is David Knuff. Uh, I'm here teaching in the WSU postgraduate diploma program. Uh, so I'm happy to be here and happy to, to be back in Saudi Arabia. So uh, that being said, let's get right into the content for tonight and what we want to cover. So. Uh, just an overview of what we're going to be doing tonight, overview of the lecture. So I want to debrief the exercise um, that we started doing last time we met. Um, so we'll debrief that exercise and then we're going to move into uh, end user involvement related to project teams. Project management, the duties of a manager. We'll talk about management versus leading and then from there um, we'll start talking about characteristics of leaders and then tonight I, I mentioned it yesterday, but we're going to do it. I know you just allowed movie theaters to open here uh, in, in Saudi Arabia after 35 years. So in honor of that, we're actually going to watch a movie tonight. Um, and it's a short movie, but it's a film about, you know, we talked about social principles and the social influence. And it's, a, it's one of the best movies ever made. It's an old movie. It's black and white. Um, but it talks, it utilizes the principles in the movie. It's an amazing movie and it talks about groupthink. We talked about groupthink and how it's tough to stand up against a group and that's the whole purpose of the film is to look at uh, that dynamic, that situation and it's very relatable to what you find in, in project teams. And so I think it's, it's called 12 Angry Men uh, is the name of the film. Has anybody ever seen it before? Have you ever heard of it before? It's an old, old 1957, uh, but it's really, really, really good. Uh, I also have emailed you for tonight. I emailed you the notes. I also emailed you the assignment for tonight. That's going to be tonight's assignment. So as I, uh, as we're looking at the film, the short film, make sure that you know you're following along with the questions so that you can even start answering them. Okay. So any questions about what we want to cover tonight? No, no, and I apologize again, ladies, you know, I like to try to move around on both sides, but I'm stuck over here for the next uh, 30 minutes, so I hope they edit that part out, but I don't know. Uh, I hope they edit most of it out. But I want to start tonight by talking about last night and talking about that difficult exercise. And I asked you to answer some questions, not about, oh, thank you for <laughs> Sorry about that, it's the camera. Um, I want to talk about the process and the process, of the team process, and not how many answers you got correct or how many you got incorrect, but I want to talk about the, the process. And I started looking, and thank you for those of you that emailed me your assignments. Some of you that emailed them early, I started looking at your responses. Some of you just emailed me right before class, and so I didn't have a chance to read through those. But let me, let me ask you about the process and the questions that you answered. So tell me what you, um, what you found out about the process or, or what part of the process, I'll ask that question, what part of the process, the team process, did you think was most important from last night? Or was there an important part of the process? I'm sorry? How to plan? Well, let, I guess let me ask you this. When you got the assignment, when you got the assignment and the directions, how did you start? What was the first thing you did? Okay, hold on. I had first voice over here, so first voice, Lulu wins. So there wasn't a socialization process, you just you knew each other and so you got right into it. What about you guys? You had not worked before, I know you've sat in class before, but you didn't really know each other. How did you start? So you jumped right in, thinking, ah, oh, we'll get through this pretty quickly, and then you said, uh-oh. Yeah, it was not easy. And we, we shifted to other uh, pages, and we found something that's chemistry, so we explored other pages, so we identified oh. something 
Okay, so you, it forced you to go back and kind of start from the beginning of a bit, a bit more planning, as, as Ahmed said. Yeah, Safa. Mm -hmm. so, so you started by saying, well, this is our deadline, this is our time, let's make sure that we adhere to it. So several things, several pieces of the things that you each did and are talking about are important to think about when you start, before you start a project and before you start with your team. And those things that I'm hearing that are very important uh, are first to know who's in the room, know the expertise of the people that are on your team. Why is it important? Why do I say that's important to know the expertise of the people that are on your team? Yeah, you know who has the skill set and who you need to refer to if you have a problem, who you need to ask questions of. So it's important to know the assets that you have on your team. So instead of just jumping in and saying, let's get this done, you know, you don't know who is on your team and someone that might have a skill set that you don't. And that's usually what teams are. Everyone brings something different to the table. So that's important. The other thing that I think is important is the timeline that you set. And not just the timeline, but to me what is a very important beginning steps anytime you're working with a team are setting ground rules. And timing, time is just one of them. You know, here are the tasks, but also how are we going to come to an agreement? What's the process? Just so you know what the process is and setting those ground rules before you come to a situation that you need to use those rules. So let me tell you what I, let me give you an example of that. If you have a group of seven and at some point, let's say your team is seven people and at some point there's disagreement on what the next course of action is going to be. If you haven't gotten a set agreement on how you're gonna make that decision, what's gonna happen? People are gonna be bickering back and forth, people are gonna be yelling, you know, saying, I want it my way, you're wrong, I'm right, this and that, this and that. And had you taken the time up front to say, listen, anytime there's a disagreement, these, this is how we're gonna resolve it. You could be in a situation where the leader says, I'm the boss and I resolve it and everyone else is quiet. Or you could get to the, we're going to do a vote and the majority has to win or it has to be all, everybody has to say yay or it doesn't happen. The film that we're going to see, you're going to see the different types of voting that can occur. Whether it's done in secret or whether it's done publicly, you know, write on a piece of paper and put it in, yes or no, or raise your hand, yes or no. What's the difference, or why is that different? You know, you could, so if, 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 with paper, nobody knows what you're saying. If we talked about groupthink and the way to avoid just everybody going along with it because of the group, there's a lot of pressure. Remember I showed you the lines on the, on the board? Writing in something on a piece of paper and not knowing who wrote it is, takes away that opportunity to everyone raise their hand, the last person say, okay, now I have to raise my hand because there's a lot of pressure. You're going to see that existing tonight in the film. Uh, so much pressure on one individual. It's a really, really interesting um, film. And then the last thing that, that each group said something I think is important when you start is you talked about dividing up the tasks and knowing the background, saying, OK, you start on this, you start on this, and I'll start on this. That's also good to say, knowing my, who I have, what assets I have in the group, it's important for me to be able to divide that up. So for you, it happened after you, yeah. Yeah, and of course, something like this, you know, it's, a, it's, it's easy to get started and get going in it, but it's meant to be symbolic or similar to when you engage in a project that's much bigger. But the same process needs to take place. The same thing, let's, set the, let's know who's on the team and let's set some guidelines. It reminds me, you know, I still remember this. Well, what you're talking about, just getting in and going. I still remember this as a kid. I was maybe 10 years old. Someone came to our school and they said, okay, we're going to teach you about working and, and I even forget what they were trying to teach us. And they said, but I remember the task they did. And they said, okay, we're going to give you a sheet of paper. We want you to follow the instructions on the sheet of paper and then uh, we'll score it at the end. And so, and it said, make sure you read every instruction on, make sure you understand the whole task before you can, you know, before you do anything, make sure you, and you follow the instructions. So the instructions on the assignment were 
read every question all the way through before you start completing the tasks. But the first question was like one plus one. Oh, two. Okay, favorite color, blue. Okay, and you're just going, you just, you don't, you, you want to get it done because you jump right into it without reading and understanding what the full task was. And by the time you got to like number 20 on the list of instructions, it said, do not answer any of the questions above. You know, you've probably seen something like, and I was like, oh, everyone, and I think everybody in the room said, oh, like nobody followed instructions. No one knew what the, what the, what the, what the project was. And so it's important to know what the scope, what, what you're trying to accomplish. What's the scope? What's our budget? What's our time? You know, understand all of those things from the get-go. And, and setting rules from the get-go. It's important. And the pen, the pen was meant to be symbolic, and so, you know, the pen probably didn't matter much last night, or the pencil, because the, because the questions were very difficult. But imagine if you had, you know, if they were all simple math problems, like 2 plus 2, 4 plus 5, you know, 100 times 100, whatever it is, and you had five minutes to get it done and you had one pen, one resource, you know, then it would be, you'd be fighting for that pencil or that pen saying, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me, you know. And so certain types of constraints uh, will cause people to behave in certain ways. And so had that been the case with a pen or pencil, then there could have been a rule established for that too. You know, I know never, you're never going to have one pen in a group. That's not the point. Um, but resources sometimes are going to be scarce. And so you need to identify up front how you're going to be utilizing those resources and how you're going to share those resources. So any, any questions about that assignment last night? Do you, I mean, do you understand how that can relate to working on a project team? Is that, um, and that was difficult. Would it, let me ask you this. Would it have been different if you had access to computer? What, what would you have done differently? Besides look things up. <laughs> yeah, Google. <laughs> yeah, besides Google. <laughs> you can divide the task easily. So one would search for the and one can, you know, uh, just resolve the, the practical, you know, what it would be more easy. Yeah, so clearly with technology, you, could, you probably would have gotten a lot more questions correct. And that was actually something that I was contemplating before we started to say, okay, the last 15 minutes, like with 15 minutes left to go, say, okay, now you can use your phone or your, your, uh, your computer. Um, and I was curious to see what that would have done to the team process, and especially with only one pin, you know, how that would work. Now, it was also groups of four and three. That's easy. Imagine if you had six, seven, eight people in the group, right? How would you... Difficult, right? And how would you get all, you couldn't, you probably couldn't go through the same process you went through last night if you had, if you were all in one group or you had four more people in your group, it's, it's a lot more difficult. And what, what do you think would be the most difficult thing in that, in that assignment last night, that team assignment, what if we added four more people in each group? What do you think would have been difficult or the most difficult in that situation? What do you mean? Yeah, if you had to, so to uh, assign a leader or designate a leader in the group, okay. What else do you think would have happened if you had four more people in the group? You would have disengaged persons that you would just like for the long, so you wouldn't just yeah. make yeah. everything to the rest of the group. Yeah, and so think, yeah, think about, the, the, that's, that's what I was, was wanting to get. There, the, the dynamics would change significantly. And if you had eight people in that group, imagine that. You had one sheet. Now, what would you have done? If, if two people were working on it, you'd have six others that were, you know, maybe three of the eight would be engaged, maybe four. But then you're going to have others that are disengaged. And if you don't identify who the leader is, it's important you can identify a leader and identify what the ground rules are in terms of who's going to, how you're going to vote, how you're going to decide on something. But that leader is going to be responsible to make sure that those people aren't disengaged, to bring them in and be a part of the team. And maybe it's you know, a needs assessment up front and saying, okay, what skill sets do you have? Okay, I know I've got two engineers and I've got uh, a couple creatives. Okay, I'm going to put you in one group, you in one group, you, you do page one, you do page two, you do page three. 
You talk about it, fill out the ones you can, and then you, know, you could put a system in place. Because you had an hour's worth of time, right? And so you had time, or 45 minutes, you had time, um, you could have put some system in place, some planning in place, instead of just jumping in and doing it. Do you understand what, what I'm trying to communicate? Okay. So the question was, how do we make people who are disengaged more engaged? How do you get them involved? Okay, what do you mean by asking direct questions? Yeah. I, I didn't know who was saying it. The wall was in the way. Yeah, so, I, and, and maybe it's a direct question, but I mean, that's going to happen. And, and so as, if you've identified a leader, which is important to do, because if you don't have a leader, then you're just going to let that person social loaf. The leader is, or, or the project manager, let's say, has the ability to say, hey, I can tell you're disengaged right now. They're probably not going to use those words. But hey, let me ask you something. Hey, what do you think about this? Let me get your input on this. Or hey, I need your feedback on this. And it, you know, that was, that's in a short time frame. We had 45 minutes. But in a long-term project, you want to make sure that you're having, we talked about feedback last night. We talked about the timeliness of it. We talked about all those things related to the goals. And you want to make sure that you're having those conversations. Mm -hmm. And if you think someone is, is disengaged, you, say, you, know, you, you want to do the work up front to make sure everything's aligned. Your goals are aligned. The project's aligned. It aligns with everything um, that you're going to do from the beginning. But then as you notice, then you have to have that follow-up conversation and just ask. You know, how are you doing? How are you feeling about the project? Are you, how are you feeling about your contribution to the group? So mm -hmm. You could even, uh, we talked about 360 reviews. You could even have, you know, uh, anonymous uh, 360 or, or, or how are you feeling about this project? How do you feel about your contribution? Uh, how do you feel about the direction? Do you feel we're going to be on time? You, know, you can ha have those types of questions as part of your, uh, you know, weekly check-in or as part of your, standard um, updates. Does that make sense? What's the most important thing? Yeah, that's exactly, and I'm saying up front, everyone has to be aligned up front. The system should, should, should follow that. Yeah, and, but as, as soon as you notice that, as soon as you see it, you, you're saying you have to address it right away, right? Yep. Yeah, as soon as you see that, you can't let it work itself out. Mm -hmm. You have to take charge. Yeah, my question, uh, my question, what's the appropriate way to respond if you have a uh, leader who wants to Yeah, so it's the same. Well, the system is, should be in place, and you hope you have a system in place that identifies or gives everyone an equal opportunity to use their skill set. But then if you notice that, you have, to, you have to ask about it. You have to communicate that. Mm -hmm. Communication is key, and you don't just wait until they have their goal check-in to say, well, let's look at your goals. It's like, I noticed something, Lulu. I noticed that you're disengaged. You know, I noticed something. What, 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 what's going on with you right now? You know, what, what's happening? What do you think about this project? Let's, let's engage. Let's find out to bring you back in. Hey, I need your help on this. I really need your help on this. You know, I feel like we're, you know, we're a week behind, and I know that that's your expertise, and that's your defense is your specialty, and gosh, I need, I need your help. I need your input. What are we missing? Can you take another look at this? You know, do something that will help them engage. Um, I'm going to talk here about some, some tactics tonight as a leader to motivate people, and that will be one of them that you'll see is communicating and asking people for their expertise. There are two different types of people. Yeah. There are two basic principles in practice. The common cause that this guy is not active because of cognitive common that behavior. And what the fundamental attribution error suggests is. We, as, as humans, we try to make sense of the world around us. 
right? We're all psychologists. Congratulations, you're all psychologists. But we're active psychologists trying to understand why people do the things that they do, right? And what we have a tendency to do is if it's something about, this is originally how the fundamental attribution error was, was described, if it's something about me or you as the individual, if something's not getting done, it's because of situational factors. So if I'm not doing my job, if I'm late to work, it's because the baby was crying. It's not because of me. It's because I had other responsibilities. The traffic on the freeway was bad. If, you know, if I'm late, it's not my fault. We, we try to figure out, make sense of why it's happening. And if I'm late to work, or I never turn my, you know, my things in on time, it's because I've always got to distract. If it's, when it's an individual, you say that it's situational. Mm -hmm. But when we're making sense about someone else's behavior, we say it's that person. Yeah. We attribute it to the individual. So Sarah is always late. Every day she's late to class. And I'd say, well, gosh, Sarah is just a late person. That's just, her per that's just who she is. She's never on time for anything. You know, she's never going to be on time. That's just who she is, right? But when it's me, it's, there's other situations that are keeping me, but when it's somebody else, we attribute it to that person. Now, this ties into performance as well and how we evaluate people is because we also look at the roles that people are filling. And what's interesting is that we have some expectations in certain roles that certain types of people will be in those roles. So let me explain what I mean by that. Um, ah, you know what, we'll hold off on that. We have a slide, we'll get there in a little bit. But the fundamental attribution error is when it's something related to us as individuals or something, we say it's the situation around us that's occurring. But when it's others, we say it's their personality, it's their disposition. That's the fundamental attribution error. And so we do it all the time. The question is, well, what do you do? How do you get around that? If Sarah's late every day, I might have to have a conversation with Sarah, and I will if I'm the team, if we're in a project and it's impacting the team, I need to have that conversation and say, hey, what's going on? I'm noticing this behavior, and this behavior is impacting the team. What's going on? Is there something I can do? What can we do to make you show up on time? Right. And if she says, oh, I just can't get out of bed. I'm just so tired, you know, I just, it's like, well, you know what, we'll have coffee or something, but having the conversation, that you're, it's negatively impacting the rest of the people. But if it's something that, that you can control, maybe it's something like, hey, well, listen, I'm late every day to this meeting because I have another meeting scheduled by another person that ends at 10, and this meeting starts at 10, and that meeting's across the, the complex, and I have to run to try to make it here by 10, and I'm never going to make it on time because that meeting always ends right at 10, and this one starts right at 10. Well, now it truly is a situational factor, and now I can address it, and we can say, you know what, okay, we'll, we'll start at 10.15. But understand, and instead of just making the attribution and assuming, you ask and you get to the point of what's going on. Maybe you could use the layer process and find out what's going on. Listen, acknowledge, explore, and then respond. Remember that? What'd you say? Attribution. A T T R I B U T I O N. Attribution error. Well, we spent a lot of time on just the what we're going to cover tonight slide. Yeah, no, I'm just saying I realize that's uh So maybe we'll have to uh, this is what I was just saying. We're all psychologists. We try to make sense of the world around us. Um, and again, you have these notes. I emailed them to you, so I'm going to skip over that. Well, this last point I'll highlight. That when we do make the error, it could have negative impl implications, right? If we make mistakes and we make some attribution, when we commit the fundamental attribution error, there are potential negative outcomes. And, and we're wrong, right? We could be wrong. Now, sometimes it might be right, but committing the error without knowing, you're, you have the potential to commit that error. Um, oh, look, here it is. I have it, it even has its own slide. So you have the slide. It's basically everything that we just talked about, right? Look at that. 
It's like we knew it was in there. So let's move into, so if, if we, you know, we want to be careful, we aren't trying to motivate people, we don't want to commit this fundamental attribution error. So what are our roles? So as a project manager, what roles do we have or what are we trying to accomplish? Well, of course you're identifying the stakeholders' interests, expectations, you're driving commitment. So you're doing, you're setting all the expectations. So expectations is going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to talk a lot tonight about expectations. Alignment of expectations is huge. What do I mean by alignment of expectations? What does that mean? No, go ahead, Uday. Yeah, okay, to bring everything on, to meet the expectations of the, of the organization, yes, that's important. Right. Everybody involved is going to have expectations. Everybody involved is going to have expectations. And you want to make sure that your expectations line up, especially when you're talking about the end user too, the, the stakeholder who's going to be buying the product from you. If you're, if you're, you know, we talked the other day about uh, building a bridge to Bahrain, right? What if you were contracted and you were building a bridge to Bahrain and you ended up building a bridge from Jeddah to, I don't know, what would be, is that Egypt? That's a long ways to go for a bridge, right? Not too bad. But let's say you were contracted for that and you built a bridge or some way to get across, and it's like, whoa, whoa, you built the, it's the best bridge, it can be the best bridge in the world. And it gets people from one landmass to another landmass. But the expect, but you missed the, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously making a, a crazy example, but imagine if it was, the bridge was supposed to have a, a drawbridge so boats could get through, or was supposed to have lights, or the lights were supposed to be in one location, they end up being somewhere else. You know, if you, if, and that happens all the time in projects. You deliver something that you think, oh, this is gonna, this is gonna blow them away. This, this, they're gonna be so happy with this thing that we did, this project that we completed. And then the end user says, we didn't ask for that. What is that? Up front, you have to make sure the expectations are lined up. I'm sorry? Scope creep. Scope creep. Yeah, so scope creep. But I wouldn't even say that it's necessarily scope creep. But, but so, so here's what scope, scope creep is. You're adding things in, right, because you think, oh, this is going to make it better, and this is the thing, and, and they're not asked for it. But, but what I'm even saying, even beyond the creep, I'm saying the basic delivery of the basic thing, the, the scope, if it is not explicitly clear and there's any room for interpretation, and it's not that, that it's creep, it's okay, what color is the bridge gonna be, let's say. It's gonna be a color, right? And if that's up front and maybe the, the, the bid or maybe the, the end user says, yeah, the color is going to be, uh, uh, give me a color that can be misinterpreted, I don't know, red. Right, and then the builders think red, but they don't like that red. They want to use, you know, some other color. But it's not creep; it's a different color. And so, but you understand something as simple as that on a giant project could could be a problem. And it's not creep; it's just understanding the expectations up front. Does that make sense? So you have to make sure that everybody lines up, all the expectations line up, and your team members' expectations line up. So we understand what we're doing, and you don't want to have creep either. When, you're, when you are creating a project, you don't want to say, ah, oh, you know what, we're going to throw this in because they're going to really like this. So what you're trying to say that the other project managers will minimize the image of the scope Say that one more time, please. I'm not saying you should minimize the scope of work. I'm saying you should be explicitly clear. And, and it doesn't mean that projects don't change and the scope doesn't change. That occurs, but you don't just change it without having the conversation with the stakeholders and resetting expectations. Exactly. 
So as you go through the pro any most projects, you're going to have some, at some point, there's going to be a critical juncture where you're going to have to make a change or you're going to have to recalibrate the expectations. It happens in every project. No, nothing is the same, very rarely is it the same from day one till the, when you finish. There are always going to be contingencies and changes. But the expectation, you can control that. You can control, you don't just do it without making it explicitly clear. The expectations. Doesn't mean that, that you can always meet them, you know, but as long as you understand what they are and they're clear, then you understand what you're working towards. And that's your goal leading a group or project as a project manager is to make sure that everyone, and it's crystal clear, whether it is you know, displayed publicly so everybody sees it and everybody has access to the information, some way to know that this it's explicitly clear and this is what we're going to do. And it also means that you have often uh, check-ins, not just with your team, but with the end user as well. To make sure, hey, this is where we're at. Let's make sure that we're on task. Let's make sure that we're still meeting expectations. Let's make sure that there wasn't something that we heard differently. Um, yeah. Okay. And especially when you talk about culture, I mean, yeah, culture, I mean, even, even setting expectations, even words mean different things. You know, and so you have to, you know, uh, yeah, do I want to talk about that? Well, I always, I, so yeah, I always think about um, how certain brand names or certain, pro, certain products are, are produced and then they have names that mean different things and that wasn't communicated or expectations weren't clear and, or weren't researched enough to be able to set expectations. And the one that always stands out to me is in the, uh, there's a car company, Chevrolet, a uh, U.S. car company that uh, made a car called the Nova. Chevy Nova, N-O-V-A, and they tried to sell the Chevy Nova in Mexico. So they developed a plan, they were going to produce these cars and sell them in Mexico. Uh, well, in Spanish, Nova means no-go. And so they were trying to sell cars that were no-goes. And for a car, that's not the thing that you want to think about when you're trying to sell a car, right? It doesn't go. Yeah, yeah. So, so there are many examples where you know you think you know what the end user wants, but you haven't communicated with them, or you haven't done the appropriate research to know what the expectations are. Um, yeah. So I said last night that we we differentiate between a project manager versus a project leader, and to me. A project manager is someone who motivates you to, or keeps you on the straight and narrow, keeps you on task. And they really are pushing you, holding you account, you know, pushing you towards um, completing the project. Uh, so what do I say up here? I say uh, pushes a team, pushes is the key word there, pushes a team to deliver on scope, schedule, and budget, right? We will get it done within scope, on time, in budget. You must be doing it. Uday, you must be doing it. I'm checking in. You, we have to finish. We have to finish. Pushing, 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 pushing. Making sure that we get it done. They want to perform like leaders, but in this conversation we started having last night, Ahmed, in my mind, a project manager is someone who's pushing, pushing, pushing. And a leader is someone who people want to get behind, they want to follow. And they want to, they, they like the vision, they like what that person's doing, they want to get behind that person. So, do you understand that basic difference? I see a product manager, I'm, you're on task, you're on task, you're on task. Where I see the leader as a visionary that pulls people along. So, and I saw a great commercial today, I meant to tell you, um, for the Vision 2030. And so to me, okay, there you've got someone, a leader, who has identified a vision. And you have potentially, I don't know all the infrastructure, but people that are motivated to be a part of that vision and to meet that goal. And, the, the, and maybe this is happening and I don't realize it, but is he the crown prince? Is that how you address him? The crown prince isn't saying, 
Sarah, do this. You need to be doing this. Come on, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? The crown prince is saying, I have this vision for a better Saudi Arabia. And this is what the vision entails. And I want to motivate people. Come on, let's get there together. But the commercial I saw that I thought was pretty interesting, and maybe this is me coming from uh, America and seeing it, but it was a commercial for um, solar panels. And a solar, power, uh, a solar panel company. And the person, the commercial was just talking, and it was like a minute long, but the person was talking about, we're in a place now where there is so much sun, you know, we've been reliant on oil for so long, there's an opportunity here, and whether this is the right opportunity or not, but I see this as an important thing to help us reach our vision of 2030, the 2030 vision. He talked about it explicitly and said, and I'm one of the people that's going to help the kingdom get to the vision 2030. And I am, and he said, and my name is, and I forget what his name, what his name was, and I forget what the company was, but I thought it was a pretty cool uh, advertisement of someone, of someone saying, hey, I see a vision and I want to support it. So, so to me, leader is someone who creates that vision, makes people feel good about what they're wanting to do, um, and, and whereas a manager is going to be, hey, stay on task, stay on task. I'm going to talk in a second about, it's not, you know, a lot of things we talk about here are ideal situations. And the reality is sometimes you don't, you, you can't get everybody to feel good about the thing that they're doing. And sometimes you have to be a little bit of a manager to make sure that you push people to get things done. But you need to understand the differences and so you can understand when it's appropriate to be a leader or when it is appropriate that you need to lean on someone a little bit to make sure they're getting something done. Does that make sense? So let's move. So this is a definition of leadership, and I was just talking about the differentiation. Um, you have this in your notes, so you, know, you don't have to copy this down because I sent this to you. Um, but I guess the key thing that I'll, I'll want to point out here is that you do have your vision, right? You have a worthy vision, and people are motivated to be a part of that vision. And this was part of your speech. You know, you, when you're giving your speech, when you're starting as your team, uh, as your leader, project leader, you know, you need to be passionate. You need to be communicating. This is why it's an important project. And this is why if you're on this team, I want you on this team because you're going to contribute. You're going to be a part of this team. But this is the vision. I want you to see the vision. Do you, you know, do you see the vision? Are you on board with the vision? Yes, I am. Hopefully. If not, then you need to have a conversation why they're not and get them to seeing that vision. Now, there's a... I always like this quote. This is from a very famous uh, football coach in, in the U.S. Uh, named Vince Lombardi. He won many championships. Um, but, you know, there's, a, there's often a question about are leaders born or are they made? You know, kind of like the cowbird, right? Yeah. Remember the cowbird? Yeah. Are leaders like cowbirds? Well, that might be a good question on the exam. Mm -hmm. Are leaders like cowbirds? Why or why not? Yeah. And then you'd have to remember what the cowbird is, and you have to remember what that ties into, and then you'd have to identify. Nanja, you don't remember the cowbird? You don't remember the cowbird? <laughs> so, are leaders born or made? No, leader. I mean, there are some characteristics that you, that, that, can be inherent in certain people, but it's not something that you're just born with. You can develop it, right? Leaders can be developed through training, through hard work to understand um, what it means to be a leader, right? We're going to talk tomorrow about even communicating and just the way you communicate, the arm gestures you move, use, the way you present information has an ability to impact individuals in, in whether they get on board or not. Uh, so we'll talk about that related to your speeches um, yesterday. About whether it's you're born or whether you're made? What, what do you mean? What do you, so, I'm sorry, explain that to me. Uh, how do I go back? What do you mean there's debate about, about what, about, it's okay, I'm just curious, I didn't understand what you, what you said. No, no, I'm just going to say, say uh, there will be whether the leaders are born or made. Yeah. Okay. They will be believing that, so 
Yeah, some people believe. Yeah, there are some people that might think that there are some fundamental things that you have to have when you're born to be a leader. And if you don't have those things, then you can never be a leader. I don't know. So here, let me give you an example. And I, I don't know, you know, for me, I, I am of the belief that you can develop skills to be good leaders. And that you don't necessarily have to be born with something to make you a good leader. And let me give you an example of what I mean. One of my colleagues at my university, uh, he tells a story. Every time he teaches, at the beginning of class he teaches, he says, it's a miracle that I'm standing in front of you. And everyone says, oh, okay, wow, this is going to be, why is that? And he says, as a kid, when he was little, he was picked on by all the other kids. They used to beat him up. He would not talk in front of anybody. He would not open his mouth. And the reason why he wouldn't open his mouth is because he had a very bad stuttering. You know, stutter, t -t 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 the speech impediment. And so he was so scared. All the kids made fun of him. He would not open his mouth. He wouldn't talk to anybody. So he'd go anywhere to a party, to anything, and he'd go stand in the corner and try to avoid anybody he could. So if I would make a prediction, of seeing that behavior from that individual, and this happened through his teenage years until he was into his 20s. I would say that is, there's no way that person will ever be a leader. No, no chance. And through training, back to the person with the bad stuttering, is that to look at him, you'd say there's no way that he will ever do anything, ever be a leader. Well, he, 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 yeah, he said, you know what, I, I'm going to figure out a way to overcome this. And he learned how to get over the speech impediment. He now is a leader within the organization. He truly is. I mean, he's giving talks in front of companies. He's giving talks. And he always starts the same way. And I'm like, now I tell him, I'm, like, I'm sick of hearing about, yeah, I get it. I understand. It's amazing. You know, it's an amazing story. But it really is. But the fact that he went from somewhere where he, yeah, he was so afraid he would not speak to through work, hard work, he's now become one of the leaders of our university. So to me, I don't know if that proves whether you're born or not, but I think you can work. And if you're not born with certain things, yeah. Now, does that mean that someone who is born without a tongue that can't speak means they're going to be giving speeches? No, but they might be leaders in other ways. Yeah. You know? Yeah, now a whole different conversation about if you're born into it. No, but if, you, if your family is wealthy, uh, and not just in this culture, in all cultures, for the history of time, right? There are people that ascend to leadership positions because of who their birth, their birthright. Does that mean they're good leaders? No. But they're given a the better opportunity than a farmer in the field, right? Um, but being a good leader n now in our society, in this day and age, you can develop and you can do a better job at developing. So who are the best top leaders in the world? Um, my favorite person is in the top picture there. And he's sitting next to Trump. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I just got recorded. Uh oh! Don't send that. Don't send that back to the U.S. Uh, yeah, not to be too political, but there's no. I mean, so leaders and types of leaders, and so you. The point I just made about born or that you just suggested, Mohammed, born into it versus working at it. Trump was born into it, and he, when he graduated university, he received a gift from his father. And this was a long time ago in the 70s, of a million dollars, which was a lot of money in the 70s. Congratulations, you finished school. Here is $1 million for you to invest in property and to start building your empire, the family empire. That is not the same opportunity that many other people have had. 
And so he was put in a position to... Now, there are many that argue that he was put in the position, but that he's not a good leader. Many are... I mean, the U.S. is... The world is very divided right now on our, on our leader. I don't know how it is in Saudi with the, with the crown prince. I think there's general cons- good feelings about what the direction the kingdom is going. Maybe, maybe they're, oh, I think uh, someone said last night that there might be some older people who aren't that happy with the way things are going. No, I think, I think in Russia they're happy. Because if not, Putin takes care of them, right? If not, no, I'm kidding. I don't record, uh, delete that too. I hope I make it home alive. Majority are happy. Uh, I put this, you have this link in your, uh, yeah, you have this link, but I just, it's a link of the world's greatest leaders of 2014, according to Forbes. I think it was Forbes. Uh, no, Fortune magazine. So you have some people on here that I know, some people I don't know. But anyway, that link's on there if you want to check out. Um, but what I wanted to talk about, and before we go, uh, we've got a couple minutes before prayer, uh, is Steve Jobs. Is he a great leader? No. So I'm curious, by a show of hands, who thinks Steve Jobs is a great leader? You just said yes, but now you won't raise your hand? Okay, he is one of, or he is a great leader, not the great leader. He is a great leader, by show of hands. Who? You just said, so one, two? You other people said yes, but now you're not raising your hand. No. Nobody said yes? So why is he not a great leader? He gave us the iPhone, he gave us uh, Apple. I mean, he invented Apple with, with Wozniak. He has to be a manager. He manages the world. Yeah. He becomes the world. Lucky person? So it's a good so why do you think why so why do you think he's not I mean he's innovative, no question about it. So why is he not a good leader? Rehab, you said no, why is he not a good leader? Oh, look, you don't want to commit the fundamental attribution error is what you're suggesting, right? Well, what we know about Steve Jobs is that he was very innovative and he was very detail-oriented and he had a vision. And it had to be perfection in his mind. And if it wasn't perfection in his mind, he would let you know about it. And he was very mean to his employees. We know about that. So mean, in fact, that the company kicked him out. But the company, without him there, without his leadership, went almost bankrupt. And they said, please, Steve, come back and help us. Please come back and help us. And he did. But how he executed on it and how he, his skill set as a leader, many people suggest that it was not very good. And the reason being, we hear all about it, not just that he got kicked out, but he was just very mean and rude to people. Well, but that's the point, is that was his style. Now, some people suggest that, you know what? Yes, he was rude and he was mean, but man, he was focused. And, and whether you liked it or not, he was going to be mean to you and you're going to have your feelings hurt. He was on track. And his point, Job's point was, you know what? Everyone that works for me can go get a job somewhere else. Apple is such a big company now that anybody that's unhappy or I hurt their feelings, there's the door, go. Go get a job somewhere else. And he actually did have a group of core people that were so loyal to him. And it's a great, the quote that I have up here on the board is that he did things that made his people so loyal. He empowered them. He gave them opportunity to succeed. But he held them to a very high standard. And the way that he held them to that standard was being rude to them and being mean to them. I'm just telling them, you're bad. You're awful. I don't know if you've seen the movie. Um, 
really interesting movie. There's a couple of them that are out, but really interesting to see his interactions. Now we assume that it's somewhat realistic. Um, but other people that say, I'm going to be just like him. And I'm going to be mean to my employees because look, it worked for Steve Jobs. You know, being mean is not a quality. He had a vision and he had people that bought into the vision and he, he gave people, he empowered people to make decisions and so therefore they were loyal to him. And they would accept, they knew that this was the expectation that he's going to be tough and it's going to be difficult but I'm going to be loyal because he gave me the opportunity. Yeah, I'd say he's, yeah, well, I, I don't know he's a good, I think he's a good leader, but in a different way, right? I think he doesn't, he, he's lacking some things, but I think the ability to empower people is huge. To say, hey, listen, go, Ahmed, go and do this thing. You have a skill set, you're hired to do this thing, now go do it. Now, if you don't do it, I'm going to tell you you didn't do it. And that's, I think, where the disconnect is, because there's a, and, and his, co, his co-founder, uh, Steve Wozniak, Wozniacki, no, that's a tennis player. Wozniak, Steve, has said, he's quoted as saying, you know what, unbelievable vision, I wish he was nicer to people, is what his co-founder said. And, you know, that's a debate on whether he was a good leader or not. We won't solve that problem tonight, and he's dead, right? And so maybe that's the end of it, is it doesn't matter, we all end up in the same place anyway, right? Uh, <laughs> what's that? The con- well, but you, th- you could argue that he put it on the track to succeed, the path to success. I mean, it would be interesting to see what, what happens. So I, I put this, um, I, I brought it up just because we had a conversation yesterday about being tough, you know, and whether that meant you were, you know, good. And I think this is an ex- a great example of someone who was very tough, uh, but was also very successful. And part of that was his, he was innovative and he knew what he wanted. And he would come in and say, you're all wrong, you need to do it this way. And that was part of his genius. But Lulu, didn't you remember the, when we talked about it, there's no, no Trump talk in here, right? We're not allowed to talk about Trump? Yeah. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, there's, no, I know, but he has a style. He has a style and some people disagree with that style and some people like that style. Now, yeah, but we have to look at the results. The thing with Jobs, he had results. And you could point to those results, and he's going to have a legacy. How he got there, some is controversial. With Trump, I don't know what the results are yet. We're, we're too soon to know. And, and if you ask him, there's all kinds of results. But we, we'll see. And, and, and it'll be really interesting to see if he, if he gets reelected or what that looks like, because you know you can run for two terms. So if he runs again... And if he gets nominated again, it'll be really interesting to see. There's a lot of talk right now, if you're following the news, asking him to resign. Um, Uh, The the, the link on this page, and I sent you again these slides, uh, it's a really good story in Harvard Business Review, uh, and it's the link that's at the bottom about Steve Jobs and his leadership style. Really interesting, easy, short article, like 10 minutes to read. But really interesting. So that's the link that is on the bottom. So, yeah, okay. Here's another. So here's a company that's going to be soon. Do you see it's going to be valued at $1 trillion? About to be Microsoft. And here you have somebody who, by, all, by, mo, by many accounts, was very driven, just like Jobs, very competitive, very much holding people accountable. But his interactions, by most accounts, are nice, and he's he nice to people. people. I'm sorry? He was kind to people. He's, because of that, he was kind. He's kind to people. And he's committed to give away his fortune to the world. You know, and they have all these billionaires now that are saying, we're going to give it back to the world and make the world a better place. Not the same type of person that Steve Jobs was. was one better, they're both extremely successful. Well, one's dead and one isn't. No, that has nothing to do with it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's right. 